uh, thanks, Megan. But uh, you know, I'd be I'd prefer to be sitting in a nice shack with you on Lake Tamiskaming doing this remote from there. So next time, that's that's where we'll hold this from. Um, so uh, this is good. I'm gonna go. I'm just gonna start on one slide, and only if uh, people have questions, why go to data slides? I just want to use one to get us started, and uh, then we'll see if uh, if if we can get enough questions going. And it's this slide. Is that one showing up, Megan? Okay, let's let's just get right to the the question at hand. Uh, May, Megan's question was that uh, growers up in your area, apparently you had a thing called rain last year, uh, five inches in June. I think last time we saw five inches of rain in a month was when put it over here, September uh, of 2019. We had a really wet fall. So we haven't seen moisture like that for a uh, couple, several years out on the prairies here. So uh, the question was that uh, with five inches of rain in June, uh, growers thought they saw some losses of nitrogen and came in and, and did a rescue top dress. And to that, I say, right on. That's, that's what you do. Uh, you intervene when there are what we call catastrophic losses. Uh, that's out of the normal. So, but really uh, the mission in fertilizing canola with nitrogen, uh, I'll just run through the process here. I, I'm sorry, I've got a wheat plant there, not canola. But the mission at the end of the day is to get about 3.5 pounds of nitrogen per bushel into that plant uh, from uh, from, from the soil supply. And how you're gonna meet that soil supply is through fertilizer that you provide, uh, manures, previous crop uh, credits or things like that. And I have here on the graph, I don't know if my pen is going to work that, that well, but of course you, we, we, we put on various fertilizers. They go in the so soil, uh, in the soil, of course, the, the, uh, the first reaction product usually is ammonium, then it converts to nitrate, and then the majority of that nitrogen taken up by the plant is in the, the nitrate form. It comes with the water supply uh, because it's a mobile nutrient. As the plant transpires, it gets water and it takes up the nitri nitrate nitrogen that's there. So in a, uh, I guess, I guess a, a perfect system, that would happen without some of the potential losses. Uh, just go through here. Uh, the, the first loss that we're concerned about often is volatilization. That's if urea forms or whatever are just too close to the surface and we don't get uh, uh, rain to take it below the soil surface and lock it in. So that's one potential loss. Uh, the other one that uh, most people ignore uh, but we, we address it out here in the prairies, maybe without thinking of it, uh, but uh, particularly in these zero tillers, we can immobilize a lot of nitrogen and residue and microbial biomass if we just spread it on the surface or broadcast. However, if we band it beneath the soil surface, uh, we actually curtail the amount of immobilization and give a, a, a real advantage to the crop. Uh, I'll try not to preach too much about banding today, but that is the, that's the silver bullet. Uh, and the other losses uh, tend to occur once we have that nitrogen is converted to nitrate form. So if it's leaching uh, on well-drained soils, but the big one out here, and this will be the killer in Tamiskaming too, I'm sure knowing your clay soils is denitrification. And the rule that we use in this part of the world is that for each day that soil is saturated or waterlogged, we lose two to four pounds of nitrogen per acre per day, uh, simply through, and that's, that's with cool soils. So if that was with June rainfall, 
you can at least double that. It would be four to eight pounds of nitrate, nitrogen per acre per day uh, you would lose uh, because it's a microbial process and when the soil's warmer, that just occurs that much faster. So your, your mission as a grower is to uh, try to do what you can to dodge those obstacles so you can get 3.5 pounds of nitrogen per bushel into that uh, growing canola crop. And so there's a bunch of strategies to do it. That's the, the great thing about managing nitrogen. There's lots of ways to accomplish that. Uh, how we do it out here most efficiently is we band it in the soil close to the seed, uh, uh, close to seeding time, and that's the gold standard. Uh, uh, but there are other many other ways. Uh, ways, if you're dealing with a high moisture environment, uh, could be doing something like that, but it could also involve enhanced efficiency products that uh, slow down, or I'm gonna try to put an X through here, that slow down that conversion to ammonium to nitrate, or it could simply be uh, uh, a controlled release product like ESN. And I, I'm glad I see my friend Tarlick on the line from Thunder Bay. He's done a lot of uh, work, research work with ESN, showing that uh, sometimes it can more accurate, adequately meet the nitrogen needs of the crop. We only see that happen here in wet years. In dry years, it's of no advantage whatsoever. And so in a dry environment, you just save your money. But you move to a, a, a excess wet environment, that's where the data, our data shows uh, there could be an advantage. I'm ready for questions. Uh, Barry, Barry asked, um, is there a sliding scale on water saturation or temperature to measure N loss? Maybe he can elaborate. Uh, uh, yeah, there is. Uh, I don't have this written down there, so you just have to listen close. That uh, for bacteria, and bacteria is what drives the denitrification losses. Uh, all, all we, a thumb rule we use is bacteria. Every time you go up 10 degrees C, you double the rate. So that thumb rule, I had two to four pounds of nitrate in per day. That's at five degrees C. So that's early spring, maybe even before seeding. Saturated soils then, that's how much you're losing. If you're in uh, late May, soils by then have warmed up to 15, then you would double that rate of loss. But if you're in July and August, where soils might be 25 degrees C, you've doubled and then doubled again that loss. So that's why these heavy rains on warm soils, we'd say that's catastrophic. That's, that's maximum loss potential. Very good. Um, a couple questions about split applications of nitrogen. So what would be the timing in canola and, and what might be uh, the benefits and how late can we put that second app on? Uh, that's a, a good question. And Megan, I, I presume you're also on the Canola Council Watch uh, newsletter. And they in fact put that question out just yesterday and Warren Ward is writing on that but for a completely different reason than you wet folks are thinking. It's because out here where it's dry, farmers are thinking, I'm not investing all my dollars in that crop if it stays dry and yields 20 bushels an acre. Uh, only when I see a chance of good yield potential, am I gonna put the rest on. So uh, there's two ways of doing split. One is a buffer against wet weather. The other is a buffer against too dry a weather and low yield potential. So uh, the timing, uh, I'm not a big fan of delaying, uh, but you would, uh, you have to go on uh, uh, where I see it here, people doing it at the early rosette stage so that you still have a chance of dribbling onto some soil rather than uh, uh, putting it all on the leaves. Uh, we do less broadcast uh, granular out here. They tend to be more dribbled, 28%. And you can get some pretty good leaf blotching. I don't think that there's yield impact, but you can make the field look pretty ugly if you uh, dribble 
uh, a lot on the leaves. So, uh, and I think Warren and his thing says somewhere, you know, you could start at the two to three leaf stage and have make sure you're done by the six leaf stage. Definitely. Yeah, definitely yeah. before bolting. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, the, the plant is taken up. Uh, I see some of the numbers out here, nine pounds of nitrogen per acre per day. You, you don't want that crop shorted uh, at that time. So, uh, yes, uh, sulfur, we maybe have a little more leeway. Some of the sulfur, uh, we've had rescue operations here. Oh boy, uh, well into bolting, uh, they can work. But uh, for nitrogen, I think you would target it on the earlier side. Uh, I, now, I, I don't want to preach, I want to have a discussion. Uh, what worked for your guys? Yeah, Terry, you have a kind of follow-up question there. I don't know if you wanted to speak up. Yeah, so just most of our uh, N goes down as urea, and uh, we typically mix ammonium sulfate in it to get 20, 25, 30 pounds of sulfur. Um, but I do have some guys that split it. Is there any advantage to splitting? Because uh, it's kind of that two sources of N, but splitting the sulfur uh, seems to be an advantage. I don't know if you could comment, John. Uh, well, I can't, uh, this is for uh, pre-plant or this is for the, the split application. Yeah, so starting starting off with an early, like typically guys will work in the urea ammonium sulfate, but okay. I do have some guys that split them apart and pull the sulfur back. Oh, okay. And, and but the, the the urea worked in, and then they'll broadcast the the ammonium sulfate on the surface. Um, okay, uh, yeah, that yeah, we could we could talk about some chemistry uh, out here. Uh, <laughs> you know, of course, we think urea on the surface is a dumb idea because you set yourself up for volatilization. So you cover that by by uh, uh, treating it with agrotane or or something like that or you put it on just before rain. Uh, most people think ammonium sulfate, there's no losses when you put it on the surface, but indeed uh, we can get losses, but it's not dependent on urease. It just occurs if we have high carbonated soils. So, uh, and we have that on our eroded knolls out here. So we can get nitrogen losses from ammonium sulfate put on the surface also. And so, uh, but again, the, the coverage for that is if we can time it before rain, that's good. Uh, but there is no agrotane for ammonium sulfate. Ammonium sulfate, if it sits on the surface where there's free lime, you can lose a portion of that nitrogen. You don't lose the sulfur. Uh, and so as far as splitting it, no, I can't, I, I can't think of any reason why I'd want to drive over the field twice to, to split that. If you've got a decent blender, you, you can blend that up and Hopefully your product integrity is good enough that uh, the sulfur isn't fine and it spreads the same distance as the urea. Uh, I, I trust you've got the mechanics right. Uh, I'm wondering if we're not applying sulfur right away, is that a concern? Or maybe we have some in the soil to carry us through? Uh, the, 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 the critical time is uh, a little later. Make sure we've got it on not just on the ground, but in the plant uh, before we get to the flowering stage. But certainly under severe deficiencies in the West, uh, we see deficiency symptoms showing up at weed spray time. So, uh, you know, we've got a philosophy out here that the nutrients in the ground uh, to start the season is probably a good and a safe way to go uh, because that way we're not risking stranding it at the surface or or leaving it vulnerable to a volatilization pathway. But it's a good rescue application. It, you know, thank goodness it works as a rescue. I'm not sure I want to use it as a plan, but I, I, I think it's great that it works as a rescue. Uh, Jason Seed had a question. I'm not sure if he wanted to speak up, Jason, or if we've already kind of addressed that about disking in and uh, with wet soils. If you want to unmute. Sorry, I, I, I don't know if I didn't catch John talking about it earlier. 
Um, when he was talking about the two to four pounds end loss per day, that's on straight surface applied broadcasted urea. Uh, no, sorry, I should. That that is the nitrate. That's only affecting the nit the, the the nitrogen that's converted to nitrate. Uh, I then I then tell you how much we can lose the volatilization of urea on the surface. Uh, you know, for that we can lose. In studies here uh, on uh, uh, warm soils, we could lose uh, a quarter of that urea nitrogen in a week, potentially under worst case examples. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so that, that there's been lots of research done on that. I, I don't want to insult your intelligence by telling you what our numbers are, because I'm sure you have uh, good experience there. You just know that if you don't have rain in the forecast within four days, three or four days, you don't lay urea on the surface unprotected. You work it in or, or you, you, you treat it. Uh, working it in, you know, there's this disturbing research done by uh, uh, Rochette in Quebec that tells us that if we don't work in our nitrogen deeply, that will get volatilization losses from shallow incorporated urea. And I think really that's a heads up for people that use things like vertical till to incorporate the urea. It just isn't deep enough. Uh, we don't measure a lot of those losses out here because thank goodness we don't broadcast and work in urea. We banned it. And usually when we banned it, we're at seeding, we're running a press wheel over that. And we, when we do our measure, we measure precious little, if any, volatilization loss once we put nitrogen in the soil. But if it's loosely incorporated at shallow depths, I think you can still have losses. That, the Quebec research tells us that. So there's a question. Do you know how deep it needs to be to limit ammonia volatilization? Three inches, <laughs> you know, how, how, how limited do you want to be? Okay, you're gonna bear with me here. I'm gonna scroll through a whole bunch of slides until I get to the one that has that answer based on Rochette's work. So it's right up here now. And look at that bottom graph. And this is a, a Rochette's summary of looking at losses. So, uh, that bottom slide shows that if it's left at the surface, uh, it, they're saying, said, okay, I could have 100%. If, if a surface loss is 100%, if it's incorporated one inch deep, then I get maybe 60% the loss that it would if it was on the surface. If I put it down two inches deep, I still get 30% potential loss. But once I've got it worked three inches deep, then I'm almost zero loss. No, there's a lot of scatter in that data, right? So there's a lot of scatter. So there's no uh, uh, sure thing on this because sometimes we can leave urea at the surface and there's no loss. Like uh, I didn't mention this, but if the soil is bone dry and those urea pellets don't melt down, there, there's not much loss going on. But once those urea pellets melt down and we have moisture, and it wicks off, then we have losses. So uh, that this is this is the data that your your neighbor in Quebec has generated. So I tend not to believe it quite so much, but I think you folks probably should, because out here we just apply our urea differently. It, it's rare that anyone would be broadcasting and incorporating urea. That's uh, that's not a best practice. We'll start with uh, another one of Terry's questions. Are volatilization losses variable with soil texture? Absolutely. Uh, they're worse on soils with low buffering capacity and low cation exchange capacity. So the losses risk is, is, is much higher on a, a sandy loam soil than a, a clay loam or a clay soil, just because they're uh, uh, what happens, we put urea on, you can get uh, uh, initially a spike in pH and that helps drive the losses. Uh, and that spike is greater on a sand than it would be on a clay 
And also the clay soils have the ability to uh, latch on or hold some of that uh, uh, molecule once it converts to ammonium. So, yep, loss is bigger on sands than it would be expected on a, a clay or clay loam soil. And what about these muck or like peat type soils that we see in the Northeast? Would that be just similar to the clays or uh, very high yes, organic matter? The clays and that your kind of exchange capacity is really, really high. Uh, I would just hope that, uh, uh, yeah, that uh, we get, uh, you know, enough moisture to, to, to you know, like, like the other thing, that, that, is how much rain do we need to take it in? And it varies between a quarter to four tenths of an inch, but that's what we're looking for in order to, to dissolve that urea and take it into the soil where we wouldn't expect losses. So, so that's yeah. related to our next question. <laughs> how much yeah. rain do you estimate would be necessary to leach the urea that was broadcast and left on the surface? Um, so they've heard that a small amount of rain could actually make volatilization worse. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's the perfect storm. Uh, the perfect storm out here would be to uh, lay urea on a moist surface or to lay it on a dry surface and then get like a tenth of an inch of rain, something enough to melt it down, provide moisture at the soil surface, and then the next days are dry and windy. And then uh, it means that that uh, hydrolysis process is started and it will continue until the soil is dry again. So if it, uh, as long as there's water wicking off the soil surface, uh, the, the volatilization loss will continue. So, uh, uh, but that's it. Sometimes it takes a little bit of moisture to dissolve the pellet and get that process started. Uh, I had a farmer out here. I really liked his thumb rule he used. <laughs> yeah. You know, a German farmer came here and I, I, I like to learn from various farmers. And he said, when I go to the field to dribble my 28%, he said, if the row gator, if it's throwing up dust, I don't use uh, agrotain with it. But if there's moisture on the tires, then the agrotain goes on because then I know I've got enough moisture in the soil that that loss process can start taking place. Ian McDonald, or I think it's Ian McDonald, commented uh, that at Alora we've shown that uh, showed lots of loss applying to a damp soil in a wet year where you didn't get rainfall shortly after. Yeah. Amen to that. Thank you, Ian. Great. Uh, Terry, did you want to ask your next question about uh, federal mandates? So, John, we just had. Uh... We've got the federal mandate of reducing N by 30%. And I know there's more to the, the story behind that, but any suggestions or any without giving up yield, because canola for us is pretty much a, a direct uh, response to N. So is there any ideas, anything we could start to look at other than no tilling to preserve organic matter and some of the, you know, some of those type things you guys would do in, in the West? Um, yeah, yeah, I think we can make great strides in nitrogen management. Uh, and, uh, you know, well, shoot, I'm a refugee from Ontario, so I understand what you're dealing with there, but darn it all, you're buying air seeders. Why are you broadcasting your urea for God's sake? Uh, side band or mineral band, urea at seeding and your efficiency goes up 20% just like that. Uh, and I know, I know some of you guys are doing that. More of you do it. I, I then go through my, my 10 commandments here of why it is that banding is smart and broadcast is dumb. But uh, you know, we slow nitrification. It's not stranded at the surface. Uh, uh, we limit immobilization it's it's just the gold standard so but uh, i'm sorry i i i apologize i promised megan i wouldn't preach so so but terry you've got guys with air seeders get an extra tank shove your nitrogen below the surface in a band 
and, and you gain efficiency right there. The other thing is if you're in wet environments, nitrification inhibitors. And maybe out, out here, nitrification inhibitors, we don't see big yield responses because we don't have big losses. We rarely have wet events. But we consistently, Merituda's work consistently shows we reduce the nitrous oxide by about half consistently. So uh, whether we end up using nitrification inhibitors to uh, uh, increase efficiency or whether we simply use it to uh, reduce nitrous oxide, that's, that's going to be uh, a thing of the future. And I'm sure, I, I know you guys, you, you, you have super U. I'm sure you can treat urea with entrench uh, or things like that, or, or ESN has shown some ad advantage in this different, uh, you know, different mechanism, but there are some enhanced efficiency products that uh, are gonna help us meet those targets. So I'll close out the moisture discussion with Jason's last question, which is with persistently damp or wet soils, is it best, the best broadcasting time would be ideally in a rainstorm or when there's one in the future? Near future? Uh, yes. <laughs> Very good. Uh, I, I, no, no, uh, uh, out west here, we, we would love to be able to, to book that in. And, and I know that in the, in, in the more humid environments, that rainfall is more certain. Rainfall used to be very certain in Manitoba. Uh, but for the last three years, we've gone upwards of 30 days or more in the month of May and into June without sufficient rain to incorporate uh, surface fertilizer. So we are gun shy, uh, but we used to be much more hip on suggesting that the, uh, you know, post seeding applications may work. We've got great data on cereals showing increased yield and increased uh, protein when we do a two thirds, one third split in wheat, put the, the, the split on between stem elongation and flag, flag leaf emergence. But those are years when we have uh, uh, five millimeters of rain within four days. If we're not getting that rain, we lose that advantage. So in environments where your, your rainfall is much more certain, uh, I'd be much, much more hip on uh, uh, the split applications. Great. Uh, Barry says, let's assume he knows nothing. How close can you, how close to the seed can you band? Oh, uh, uh, that's a really good question. Our, our uh, guidelines say two inch to the side and below. And the reason is that we can put an awful lot of nitrogen with the seed. And sometimes when we have that closer than that, we can cause uh, some stand injury in canola. We can also cause a, a hot band if we're putting a phosphorus in there and a bit of a force field around it. So we do have some cautions when we're putting big rates, uh, 120 to 180 pounds of nitrogen in that side band. Sometimes uh, it can be too enough. Sometimes we need to save them up with some ESN or other things. But uh, I know some of the side band units apply closer than that. Some farmers get away with that, but in dry years, that's when we tend to uh, uh, get more burn or toxicity of the crop. So with your growers, um, are you banding and with the hoe type openers or with disc openers? Uh, both. Uh, side band applications uh, tend to be uh, I'll mention these names. I'm sure your farmers know what they are. Uh, seed Hawk or Seed Master uh, or the old server pack types where there's two shanks that run and uh, those can place nitrogen close to the seed. The other is the Borgo or other Midwell band. So John Deere 1895, I think they have new numbers now, but that type with Midwell band, they work very well, very safe more hardware and extra tank, but uh, uh, that they can work very well to band uh, the nitrogen. And uh, 
So there's uh, with uh, with a good check, it's limitless options. Um, okay, how much liquid manure might be too much nitrogen wise, not necessarily environmentally wise? Mm. Uh, 5,000 gallons per acre. How do you like that for an answer? What's the analysis of your manure? Uh, there's just too many questions. You can't answer that question on Twitter. You yes. can't answer that question in too many words, in, in a couple words. So I, I'll, I'll say, I, I'm not given an answer to that. It depends James. on how rich your manure is and how it's being applied and things. Yeah. James, do you want to ask a specific question? If you unmute. James is a dairy farmer. It, it, it's, yeah, I, 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 I gather, it, obviously, it's variable. It, it was more a matter of, you know, how much, like, because you have concern about, about over, over applying. So is there a manure point where, that's the same problem that we're just overdoing it entirely, like that we're actually going to cause injury. Uh, I've seen injury twice with manure. Uh, uh, or maybe I should say more, more than that. Sometimes uh, you can provide a lot of nitrogen and you can get lodging and things. The other thing you can do, you can trigger a sulfur deficiency. Uh, so if you're using high rates of manure, supplying lots of nitrogen, Make sure you've got sulfur there. Otherwise, if you're low in sulfur and supply lots of nitrogen, you actually make the deficiency and the yield loss worse. Uh, the other thing, and this was with banded chicken manure, we've seen it so hot that it's actually caused some uh, uh, seed burn in the past. But I wouldn't expect that with dairy manure. Um, so yeah, you need precautions, and again, you know how to. You got to be legal too. I know you've got more environmental cops in Ontario than you probably do in Manitoba. So uh, I don't. But we have we have more rules here than you do. Like we can't spread manure on the snow. We're forbidden from applying fertilizer and manure between November 10th on April 10th. So I think you've got more wiggle room, but uh, it still wouldn't get, be good to get caught putting manure uh, on the surface when runoffs. Of potential. Now, there's one thing. Uh, Tarlick uh, uh, sent me a small data set of rates of nitrogen, and uh, I may not show it here, but just to show that he's had some tremendous yields up there in Thunder Bay with tremendous response to nitrogen. So some of these crops, with uh, you know, and some of his yields were uh, on average over 100 bushels per acre. That's unheard of out here. And so uh, those certainly do demand high nitrogen rates. And a great way to meet that is with manure. Yeah, that is small plot research where we sometimes see higher yields. But um, yeah, that's great. Thanks for sharing that, Tarlock. Um, OK, Matt Bowman asks or says, we've seen in the press the introduction of biologicals as a solution to end use. Any experience or comments? Yes. I got to go to this. Sorry. Matt, you worked at the uh, uh, New Liskard Research Farm for years, and I know you want data. You just don't want me to shoot from the hip here. So I kind of busted my knuckles this last year because I couldn't get any serious researchers interested in this stuff. And that's what we need. We need some serious research to see if this stuff's ready for prime time. Uh, the two that are marketed out here are Invita and Nutricia. And um, I am hopeful, like there's real science behind this stuff. These are the ones that, uh, you know, they grow sugar cane, which is an legume, and sugar cane uh, can uh, provide about 25% of its own nitrogen through bacteria that live intercellular in it. And so they've been working for years to get this right. And some companies figure they got it right, so they're in the market. Uh, I'm sure that you've seen advertisements for Invita. Uh, Eutricia, I think it's just coming on the market this year. So I just did some small plot stuff. It then worked for me this past year. Uh, but uh, Matt, you'll appreciate this. I have below Dan Kaiser, University of Minnesota, did work with Pivot Bio. That's another biological. Uh, worked one in six times for him. That's rolling a dice. That's the number of times the one comes up. 
uh, one in six times, but he needed to do six replications, not four replications that we normally do. So it's it's more research and had to do it against a full nitrogen rate in order to show that it was providing 25 pounds of nitrogen. Boy, this is pretty sketchy stuff for me. And uh, uh, we, we need more uh, research to validate this, but th this would be the holy grail, has been the holy grail for a long time. Uh, I, just, I just hope some serious researchers get into it and validate it for us, because otherwise a lot of farmers are gonna try it and um, bruise the knuckles. I see Kim Joe Bliss popped up. Kim Joe, have you tested this stuff in the Emo Research Station? No, we haven't, John, but I just I just wrote it down and I'll maybe talk to Josh about this later. Nice to see you too. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so Claire posted a question with a couple follow-ups. So uh, Claire, feel free to unmute if you uh, want John to clarify, but they said, we have some high OM, high organic matter muck and peat ground that they're planting canola on this spring with ENR values over 100. Can that nitrogen be interchanged with N from a source like urea? And how early will that nitrogen be available? And how little could they apply without compromising yield? Uh, boy, uh, organic muck soils, that's a crapshoot. Uh, you know, we, we, we have some older research here and the response data is just a shotgun blast with a line through it. It varies so much based on environmental conditions. So Claire, if you have a cold, dry spring, your estimated nitrogen release is small. If you get a moist, warm spring, your estimated nitrogen release will be high. That, that's just the way it works. And that's just compounded on organic soils. So you just gotta take your best stab at it uh, based on past experience on managing the peats. Uh, and, you know, maybe that is a, a case where you would say, I'll put down a modest rate and I will come back if uh, 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 your potential or, 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 or maybe a split application is warranted. Uh, I don't know. Uh, out here, most people would just figure, you know, I'm just gonna go with the base rate, but we're not big fans of estimated nitrogen release. We see that, well, it's because we have something better called the nitrate soil test. You know, the nitrate soil test works for us on frozen soil. And so we just use it and it equates pound for pound. Uh, so if you're in the North, I, I don't know how much work has been done recently. Matt Bowman's on the line. I know he took lots of nitrate tests in the past. I don't know if the nitrate soil test is uh, fully exploited in the north, but I would still have more faith in that than estimated nitrogen release values. Okay, um, now Terry, is your comment about uh, response there regarding this question or? No, sorry, that's that was on biologicals. I thought after I should have stuck that in. Um, Growmark's been doing a bunch of work or with a bunch of companies in the States. They're trying to pick a partner to start to promote to us. Mm -hmm. the Gromark system and uh, the problem, everything that they've showed us so far response is probably below two and a half percent organic matter, which kind of makes sense that, you know, if, if the soil is that uh, hungry, anything's going to help it and make a difference. So I think that could be some of the stuff that we're running into in these, in these, um, you know, less than uh, response plots because we tend to have better organic matter with our livestock rotations in the north and stuff. Yeah, it, you've already got uh, you've already got the biological system working. If you've got manure, and if you have good organic matter levels in the soil, uh, it, you know there's tremendous amounts of nitrogen there. We just find out here where we get these dry seasons. Uh, it's just too risky to predict uh, release values from you know some of our good organic matter levels. But yeah, I'm I'm glad your your company's looking at uh, 
this, and I'm glad they're also trying to sort out where these have a good probability of working. That's what we need. Uh, we don't need salesmen on the road suggesting it's one size fits all. Hopefully we can sort out where it does have a fit. I'm going to take that slide down because it's too, it's just too sad. See. <laughs> Um, I'll, 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 I'll leave this one up there. If people want to test drive something, that we, we've got nitrogen rate calculators, I think kind of the same way you do for corn in Ontario, uh, but ours is based on a nitrate soil test. And then based on the fertilizer and crop price, it can uh, provide you some guidance on how, uh, uh, how you could fertilize for that canola. You know, farmers only use this when fertilizer prices are high. Otherwise, they just ignore it. Uh, but uh, so we used it in 2008, and some people are having a kick of it now. That's great. They don't so, care when night is cheap. So if we just Google uh, can or canola nitrogen calculator in Manitoba or something, it'll pop up, hopefully? Yeah, it, it, it'll pop up. Uh, I, I just I don't know what you'll do with it unless you have some guidance as far as what your nitrogen levels are in the soil. It gives, uh, uh, but you could just look at, you know, what the total nitrogen level is. Maybe it's of greatest value to compare how do the rates change as uh, fertilizer prices go up or as, as crop prices go up. That's what I think people mostly use it for. They say, oh, fertilizer just went up $100 a ton. What does that do to the optimum rate I should do. Does it mean backing off 10 pounds or 30 pounds? So while we're on the topic of the cost of fertilizer, any further just general comments about managing and at high prices? Um, oh, even Horse just wrote in there. Does the traditional uh, economic rate of N still work in this environment? Uh, it, it, it's amazing. Uh, it, the rates, the optimum rates based on all these calculators has not changed that much because crop prices have also spiked and tended to stay high. Uh, but, uh, you know, of course, fertilized prices, I, I, I think, are higher than the crop prices went up. But when we look at the rates, how they've changed, the optimum rate has changed no more than 20 pounds per acre from what normally would. The problem is there's just a whole lot more risk for the farmer, more nitrogen dollars to put out, more money to borrow from the bank. Uh, the, there's, there's a risk. And the added risk out here is that we're just coming out of a drought. We're not sure we're out of the drought. So uh, yield expectations probably should be modest rather than high. Farmers would love to exploit these high prices of crop with good yields, but right now, and I, I hate to dampen your notions there, but when I look at this map from uh, the Canadian Drought Monitor, Temiskaming and Kapuskasing don't look so great. Tells me you're abnormally dry. You're not as dry as the West is, but it's still telling me you're dry. And, and Tarlock in Thunder Bay there, uh, it must be like a desert. It says severe drought. So in areas like that, you know, maybe some of these Western calculators might work if people want to pull a soil test. Uh, it it may have a fit, but because you're under dry conditions. Okay, I may be missing a couple questions, but I do want to make sure we talk about, uh, move on to our dis regional kind of discussion and what's new in the Northeast. But I will ask one of the Terry's last questions, which was any other further comments on sulfur and boron with with those N applications? Uh, not, 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 not really, just that uh, I'm sure Terry knows that uh, uh, sulfur, we're still, uh, well, sulfur fertilizer supplies are tight, tight, tight. So I, I hope that they have sulfur in place or can get it there. Or I hope that farmers growing canola, uh, 
put some cash on the table so that their dealers will bring it in. Sulfate form is still uh, the most surefire way to get uh, meet the sulfur needs of the crop. There's an increasing number of elemental sulfur sources uh, and uh, 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 we know that there's low to release the sulfur in the sulfate form. We don't know if it's quick enough to do to work for corn. Uh, I mean for canola. It may be quick enough to work for a corn crop down south there where horse is, but uh, we're still cautious here. Um, so again, getting sulfur supplies, and I think that, that that's one of the main things, uh, get your sulfur in place if you're growing canola. And uh, uh, as for boron, we don't see consistent responses out here. Whenever it's put to the test and on farm strips, we, we don't see the benefits that, that you folks saw in Southern Ontario. You seem to see a environmental response to boron. That is response when it's really hot at flowering. And uh, we don't tend to see that same type of uh, response out here. So we're still reluctant to, well, we know where crops respond to boron. I'm pointing right on the mountain right up there in Saskatchewan. Sure fire boron response. On the gray wooded soils, it's where jack pine trees grow. If you don't see jack pine trees, your assurance of boron response is slight. Interesting. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we've had John here for 50 minutes now talking and I do wanna try to meet that other goal of the meeting, which is to have a conversation about growing canola in the Northeast. So uh, please do put questions in the chat for John, if you like, or just ask them directly. But yeah, does does anyone want to uh, start off a bit of a conversation about, uh, you know, what direction you're heading? What happened last year, maybe with your canola crop in the Northeast and what you might do differently this year? I, I might pick on Terry. We know Terry likes to talk, so. Thanks. We, uh, we replanted way too much canola last year and it really changed like some opinions. We know it's a one year thing, but um, we had a lot of canola go in in June and still made a crop in some cases almost as good as guys have had. Um, we sure don't want to promote that. You know, I still believe canola needs to go in as early as possible in the spring. So I don't know, Megan, like there's uh that's probably the biggest challenge now is going to be when when we start rolling in uh, about 85 days, we start rolling uh, drills to the field. You know, when do we plant? Because Sweet Midge, we've tried to map. Um, you know, the, the later stuff typically doesn't have an issue, but you're always under the gun to get it off the field. And, and you know, to have uh, November 1st frost, <laughs> Or late October frost is pretty rare up here, so I don't think we want to be planting in the middle of June unless we, we really have to. So maybe start a conversation with that. Yeah, well, Terry, on us, the, the small acres that did survive the frost uh, yielded 10 bushels more, over 50 bushels. So I think seeding early still paid off, especially if that first seeding would have survived. Yeah, and Swede Midge was tricky this year. Like we heard a lot of people say that they didn't really see that that Swede Midge damage that they have in the past. Um, and you know, I, I know that we've recommended early seeding to avoid Swede Midge, and I think that does make sense because they come out of the soil around June first. But we still need you know seeding into warm soils, and as you say, don't want to uh, lose that crop to frost. So it's it is a balancing act. Anybody else want to talk about um, how the season went last year and, or even how you're managing your nitrogen and, and John can jump in. I don't know if we have Will on any, or anyone else from the OCGA board. I don't know if I, well, Simon's on the board now. Is, is anyone up north trying split N apps and applications? We, we do have guys holding back the sulfur. That's why I was asking that question. The guys that do swear by it. So, you know, I don't argue with them if it's working for them. 
I see Jose up there. Jose, could you throw in anything going on in Quebec? Find my mute button. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Yeah, well, uh, acres in Quebec like seem to be pretty stable, so I don't think we're traumatized by uh, last year frost. I think that was a pretty exceptional frost uh, by its intensity and its. Uh, um, so the consequences were quite uh, dramatic. But anyways, I don't think I don't hope we see that anytime soon. So no, the, even with the nitrogen prices higher. I think uh, people that are used to grow canola are going to continue on. And those that are more uh, new into canola or maybe not sure if their fields are top notch for canola this year are going to maybe hold back because of the risk. Because it is all about uh, getting a good crop. The budget with the nitrogen value, the fertilizer value, the budget uh, ends up being okay if you get good yields. If you're not as confident as you should be that you're going to be getting good yields, then maybe you could, uh, maybe you should hold back. So that's what we're see, seeing mostly. Yeah. Yeah. Any comments on what acreage might look like in Timiskaming or, or elsewhere in the Northeast this year? I know it was one of our highest acreages since I've been around uh, last year. And also wondering what varieties uh, people are looking at. We had a big push into 340. Gas and acres, I'd say between 12 and 15,000. You know, kind of our seed sales, seed sales around us. Um, we do have a lot of 233. It tends to be anybody north of us still looking at 233, a little shorter and, and a little less sort of idea that they may have club root, where we have enough scattering and club root in the area here that it was pretty easy to talk to guys about. The next best club root variety or shatter club root variety. I think that's 340 according to BSF. Yeah, good point. Next Wednesday, we're going to talk more about club root. So we hope you guys can join for that conversation too. We're still looking at Invigor varieties and Liberty Link or more True Flex out there. We did have we did have a bunch of uh, Roundup Pretty. It's guys that are just um, not happy with the grass control. And, you know, I, we, it's too bad last year, we had uh, support from BSF to do a trial on some of the gruminocytes because we think select definitely has resistance or that resistance is built up to select because we had a lot of guys going too fast, still not getting hardly any grass control. So those are the guys that just in frustration, they're gonna try to deal. Unfortunately, they're, they're also going around to pretty beans and or around to pretty corn. So they're, they're willing to try to deal with that down the road to go back to a uh, better weed control. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of uh, uh, hesitance, hesitancy from the growers to go to Roundup Ready. They've, uh, they've, they've withdrawn from it for years and they're still seeing the voluntary canola come up in the, in the corn and in the soybeans after 10 years not growing any. So. Um, it's not a big hit here, mostly in vigor, but there are some growers that, like Terry mentions, for weed control that uh, they, they are looking into it, but we're trying to hold back from that as much as we can, just in question of, uh, of uh, weed management. Uh, well, not weed man management, but voluntary canola management anyways, because uh, it's, it's not, nothing fun to play with. <laughs> yeah, the interesting too this year, the advantage of cheap roundups gone off that picture too, because guys were looking at cheap weed control, like high rate with the true serve varieties, high rate, cheap roundup, and that's not going to happen either. And I don't know what you guys saw with you, you've grown a lot more acreage of uh, the true flex uh, on the Ontario side, but from what I saw, I don't consider it as strong in terms of uh, pod shatter resistance. I don't know what you guys think about it, but. Uh, I think it has to be considered as a, yeah, it could, it can be uh, managed as a, a straight cut, but uh, if you have, uh, if you're running into an uneven uh, maturity, uh, it won't hold as much as the, the, the Invigor. That's what, that's what I saw, but I don't have a lot of uh, acres that I've been looking at, but I'm, I'm really worried about that aspect, like not being as much, uh, 
it won't wait for the combine as much, but I don't know how much, like I just, that's, that's like maybe more of a, que a question than a comment. Yeah, that's true. It's, uh, it's selected versus an actual gene, like the invigor lines are the only ones with the actual gene for pod shatter. So it's kind of the best of the present. I think Pioneers is the same. It's, it's the best of the present sort of offer, but it's not a full on. Uh, so that environmental thing, environmental conditions could really play in there, I think, too. I guess a lot of our guys that played with it, we tried to you know, go into it with our eyes open. And a lot of those guys do still swat. So they, you know, they were willing to maybe take it, take it later than they used to swat, but, but not try to go to the full on uh, shatter. Interesting. Thank you. I'm going to jump back to the comment section here. Or, um, so John said he wanted to mention that for split or top dress applications, the dribble combination of UAN and ATS for sulfur works really well. The ATS acts as a slight urease inhibitor, but inhibitor, but not as good as agrotane. So John, I don't know if you want to speak to that. Uh, well, just I, I, I heard people talk about uh, urea and ammonium sulfate, their granular forms. I don't know how common 28% uh, or UAN is or whether you have tanks of ammonium thiol sulfate, but uh, they, they, they work well together. Uh, and that way you can meet both your nitrogen and sulfur needs. Uh, we're actually, you know, if we compare uh, potential volatilization losses, uh, the losses of 28% dribbled is slight because of the reduced surface exposure and is further reduced by adding ammonium thiol sulfate. So many would consider that a protected practice. Uh, and certainly that performs in our uh, observations here as good as even agrotane treated urea. But again, it's, you know, what's, what's your equipment and what's your access to the, those fertilizer sources? Go ahead, James. Um, just a, a, from another perspective of last season uh, was on flea beetles. Um, our experience with them is is just a mild response has always been just perfectly fine. Um, but but the last year was not at all like the mild response was virtually no response and we had to come back in again with a, a really aggressive response, shall we call it. Um, unfortunately, I'm a slow learner, so I don't even know why it was the case. And I don't know that I'll change necessarily, but just our experience last year was that flea beetles were something else. Anybody else want to talk flea beetles? And just a plug for two weeks from now, we have uh, Keith Gabbert coming on to talk about some insect management topics. James, well, yeah, were, you, uh, were, you, were you double treated, James, going in with Lumiderm or, or just uh, a seed treatment prosper of a course kind of thing? Yeah, we had, we had uh, backed off Lumiderm because, like I say, that mild response was always all we needed, just a perimeter spray and and it was really easy to control. So we've only been doing the Prosper for a number of years. And uh, so, yeah, it, it was a limited, uh, limited attack, but uh, limited attack from our point of view, uh, but the flea beetles, uh, they thrived. So we're doing Lumiderm this year. <laughs> I remember correctly, it kind of got warm early and then the temperature came back down, but the flea beetles had already emerged and they were there. And even if they're not, you know, super active jumping around they're in, because it's kind of cool, they're still there and they're still feeding and they're sometimes feeding on the stems too. So um, I do want to, again, look at this comment. So Sean said uh, they might no-till canola into cover crop of peas, oats, and radish. Not sure if he means plant green or not, but um, any concerns or do the nitrogen benefits Are we using much cover crops in canola, John? I don't know if we use a lot of cover crops in the West. Not on purpose. <laughs> uh, I I I gotta go. I gotta show this picture. Bain Fraze is on the line, and he's been my poster child for cover crops gone bad. Uh, here, uh, I don't know. Is that showing up? No, not Megan? yet. Okay. Uh, maybe I don't. A anyways, uh, we uh, 
I got to find out where I can share again. Um, that, uh, okay. Then there I, we go. Yes. Okay. So, uh, and, and yes, you don't even just ask questions to me because Dane's uh, on the line also. Dane's our canola specialist here. But, you know, I, it was quite a drought here last year. And then we got some rains in late August. And some of these crops came back to life. Uh, that's oat regrowth on the one side. And so we decided to go out there and just clip and see how much nitrogen value or nitrogen is there. So there's 80 pounds of nitrogen in those oats. And then Danes in a field of canola that uh, crop insurance didn't even say is worth harvesting. Uh, and so, and it looked like a field of sticks until we got rain in August and then it, Frankenstein came back to life. And there's quite a bit of stuff there, 160 pounds of nitrogen in that top growth. But uh, I would hate for people to think that that's available for next year's crop because research that's been done out here and in North Dakota and other areas uh, shows that cover crops uh, are pitiful poor at providing nitrogen in next year's crop. They, they seem to do a really good job of sucking nitrogen out of the soil but they're miserly at providing next year's crop and they're experiencing yield drag and sometimes need even more nitrogen to be put on. So I'm no fan of cover crops, particularly in a drought because these things were using up valuable soil moisture. So now I, I know you, you folks in Ontario, uh, uh, you're in a moisture environment, but really cover crops are the bandage you use when you do too much tillage. Out here where we do more no-till no or reduced till, I don't think you really would see a value of cover crops because we're protecting the soil. But if you're doing tillage, uh, you should probably be using cover crops to uh, as the band-aid and then try to figure out this nitrogen thing because uh, it's not doing as much help here, out here until we figure it out. How's that for throwing gas on the fire? Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping Ian McDonald doesn't uh, <laughs> hijack the meeting and talk about cover crops. Just joking, Ian. Um, I don't think there's a lot of cover crop use in the north. We There are some projects happening. Uh, Mike Pedler commented that sometimes in Ontario, we're using brassicas as cover crops, and that isn't maybe the best idea in areas where we're growing a lot of canola because of the uh, insects and diseases that may carry over. Um, now, because we've got you here, John, we're going to keep on this thread of some fertility. So Jeff is asking, uh, do you think the same concept of reduced volatilization with UAN plus ATS is true for Amidus? So hopefully you're familiar with Amidus. Um, what growth stage would you want to apply a second app on? Yeah, that, that's really interesting uh, because when we've done a uh, little test with Amidus here, uh, we get a lot of ammonia calcium. And it's because Amidus is a co-granule of urea plus ammonium sulfate. And because a lot of our soils are calcareous or have free carbonates in them, uh, th if that's left on the surface, that, ammo that ammonium sulfate, the ammonium part gases off. Uh, like I say, it needs rain. Ammonium sulfate left on the surface can gas off also. So we, we always used to set up the sniff test for our field days where we would put various fertilizers on moist soil for three days and then you would crack the lid of the container and uh, Amidas always tended to have a lot of ammonia loss at the surface. That's because we have carbonates in our soil. I think if Amidas goes on an acidic soil and I think that's where it's targeted in uh, Europe, uh, uh, it can actually be quite a good product, but uh, I think it really depends on the presence of carbonates in your soil. Uh, I haven't heard of it being marketed out here, but it is kind of a nice uh, fertilizer for canola because it has sulfur with it. And so I would just defray to what we know about soil chemistry. I said, uh, don't put it on the surface if you've got carbonates at the, you know, at the surface. Yes, I, I've heard that uh, 
it, it spreads a little better than mixing the different granular products together so you can get that sulfur spread uh, a little better. Yeah. Um, okay, Jason is has typed in the comment box, any advice for growing canola on non-tiled but okay draining clay soils? So I'm not sure exactly what advice you're going for or John, start us off if oh, you. Well, why, why don't I kick this over to Dane Dane's on the line. Dane not only is he our canola specialist, but he farms some of those same heavy clay soils. And Dane, I don't think you put any tile in the ground yet. So uh, Dane, unmute yourself and uh, tell us how you do it. Hey John, I, had, I just hung up the phone on a different conversation. Could you repeat the first two parts of your question, please? Uh, what tile drainage and what we've done on our farm? Basically, any advice for growing canola on non-tiled but okay draining clay soils? Giver, go for it. Um, as, as long as they drain all right, canola is reasonably water tolerant, especially once you get past that six lead stage. It's a little bit more susceptible again at bolting, um, and we can see some stress bolting from flooded fields. But if it's okay drain, and if you have a a reasonably well draining soil profile, some sandy or soil that are reasonably some silty silty loam. Uh, canola will do quite well. Um, it has the capability of responding with plasticity, either it'll throw branches or grow narrow depending on its spacing. Um, the roots will do the same. If it's wet and soggy, you're going to see a lot more lateral regrowth. Roots will to the surface, scavenging nutrients there. If it becomes really dry, that deep tap root is going to punch way down. And we can see canola's, canola rooting down three to four feet on a regular year and on dry years like this, we'll regularly see it hit six or seven if, if the soil has you know, uh, reasonable properties for root growth. So uh, that doesn't seem to be a problem to me. Knock yourself out. Now, and you're, uh, and you're in a uh, no-till comment. Oh, I, I just wanted to ch chime in. Dane forgot to mention that, that uh, all farmers in the Red River Valley spend a couple of weeks in the fall doing good surface drainage. So where you're flat on tile, uh, on non-tiled but clay fields, uh, surface drainage is a very important uh, part of our production system. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, make sure your drains are clean and you're not uh, filling up with too much silt. And, and uh, tillage practices have a way of filling in those drains inadvertently or or intentionally. Uh, so do the best uh, possible way to stay out of those drains. Lift up, go through them, and then put your machine back down if you are doing tillage. Awesome. Yeah, I know some of our southern Ontario growers are kind of excited about winter canola because, uh, you know, it's a little, it's a challenge to get it to survive on the clay soils, but uh, does a nice job of kind of breaking up those soils. And uh, um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of interesting to see it happening in the south too. Okay. Um, so any other questions or conversation you guys wanted to have, uh, even specific to the Northeast? Uh, now we know that Dane's on the line. We have, you know, another canola uh, specialist around. So anybody at all? I was just here, Megan, taking notes for what to cover and what not to cover for my presentation in a couple of weeks' time. So I'll do what I can if you need me. Awesome. Yeah, Dane is uh, going to talk to us about seeding in a few weeks. I think it's the fourth uh, talk on the list. So, John, just wanted to comment on your uh, moisture question because that does come up a lot. And yeah, we're wetter here, but if anything, I've got to wait on a cover crop piece of ground to dry off on the surface because of the shadowing or the, uh, the trash cover. So I, I don't foresee any moisture issue. You know, it's, it's more the other side of it where I've got to be more patient, not to uh, smear, you know, try to smear the canola seed into the ground. Yeah, we, we uh, I shouldn't have been so blatant there. We, we see a good fit for cover crops in our excess moisture years. Uh, uh, but the seed salesman wants to sell it every year. I don't know why that is. But anyways, uh, yes, cover crops uh, uh, may provide some value. But we even saw this past year in a dry year, we like to terminate our, even our volunteer crops with uh, glyphosate or whatever. We don't like 
them taking up too much nitrogen. We don't like them taking up too much water and using it in the fall. But if we were in a, a, a wet fall, uh, we might very much appreciate uh, pumping some water out of that ground. So there was a, a comment uh, or a question about, uh, I, I talked about brassicas in as cover crops and uh, tillage radish isn't exactly uh, closely related with canola. So no, uh, tillage radish specifically does not host club root and uh, is I think less of a concern with insects like sweet midge. Um, Dane, uh, commented as well, it's been shown to be resistant, tillage radish is shown to be resistant to pathotypes five and six, but hasn't been tested against some of the other pathotypes. We don't have six in Ontario so far, but uh, yeah, the pathotype conversation is a big one, um, which we may get into next, next week. The maggots sure like those big roots though. What, what's that? I forget what bug it is, but when we grew uh, oilseed radish for our diagnostic school, the uh, uh, the maggots, mm. I don't know if they're turnip maggot or whatever, uh, that they sure love those big roots. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, I don't I don't know that we have any other questions or comments here. I'm hoping that uh, so many of you will join next week to talk about club root. I think it's a very important topic and uh, we don't want to kind of stick our head in the sand on that one. And we certainly have it in the northeast um, and we've seen yield loss in that area to club root. So we definitely need to be aware of that. Um, John had asked me what the supply of fertilizer into the Northeast is looking like right now. Are we, do we have concerns with that at all? I know prices are high, but availability, how's, how's that look? No, so far we're okay. We, uh, we went through sort of over the Christmas new year. Um, we were, you know, we were kind of rationed on stuff. But uh, we were able to get some more lined up from our suppliers. And uh, the crazy part, I watched two uh, presentations yesterday, one from Fertilizer Canada and one from uh, Gromark. And uh, you start to hear the jiggling of the uh, price coming back down now, like after the Olympics are done, potentially China. China's hard date was June. I think that they would start exporting again. but. You know, the, the, the chatter is starting to be once the Olympics are put away, they may start to release some urea into the market. So, uh, you know, we went through uh, some pretty uh, tough bloodletting in 2008. So I hope we don't have to go down that road, but it would be nice to knock a couple hundred dollars off the price of urea too. So, thanks, Terry. Well, John, this has been awesome. We really appreciate you joining us. Great information and, and good conversation. I'm glad people brought their questions. Um, so thank you for that. I'm not going to keep you uh, all. I, you, I love the opportunity to, to torment my past uh, co-workers and colleagues in Ontario. So. You've hardly tormented us, John. Um, we and John, you know, has mentioned wanting to come to Ontario, so we will definitely keep you in mind. Uh, maybe for one of those northern tours, uh, get you back here and uh, and and have you speak face to face, maybe in in the field one day. That would be excellent. Um, so, unless someone jumps in with uh, some questions or comments, and please please do, but uh, I don't want to drag this out if, uh, if there isn't an interest. I've posted the uh, next few talks, so we're every Wednesday at one o'clock Eastern time, next week club route with uh, Clint from the um, Canola Council, and then Keith Gabbert from the Canola Council as well, talking about insects. Uh, Dane will be back talking about seeding on the 2nd of March. And then our last week is uh, on winter canola, which I'm really excited to have a speaker from Sweden come in. And that may not interest uh, our northern growers. I don't recommend winter canola in, uh, in northern Ontario. Um, 
But uh, I'll, I'll keep this open for a few more minutes, but I think that's all we've got for now. And I'm really glad to see at least 50 people came out today. And uh, I'm, I'm glad we can all connect online, um, even though we don't get to see each other too much right now. Thanks everyone for speaking up and for your comments.